know, just as a reflection on that first panel, uh, there were a couple things that jumped out to me. I don't, I don't know if, if uh, they may have jumped out to you, but one is actually a, a data point. Um, California has a nonpartisan uh, policy analyst office called the Legislative Analyst Office, the LAO, which essentially supports the state legislature on policy research. And a couple of years ago, they released a study on uh, what might be called migration patterns in and out of the state of California, looking at the 10 year window between 2008 and 2018. And one of the elements of that data, which was analyzed across a number of different demographics uh, and regions, household income, so forth, the number one age demographic leaving the state again, looking at that 10-year window between 2008 and 2018, were Californians under the age of 18. Now, that's not to say that we had a, a crisis of runaways. Uh, these Californians under the age of 18 were parts of families, and the families were leaving. And so the discussion that we're having at the community level they weren't just Californians, of course. They were living in particular communities, whether it was Venice or Fresno or San Diego or Humboldt County. Uh, and so the second thing that comes out of that for me is, again, to understand really when we think about declining societies and cultures is that John Doerr question, some of you know John Doerr's work in um, management consulting and, and analysis. He wrote a book called Measure What Matters. And I hope one of the themes that comes out of both uh, today's conversations and tomorrow's is in the field of public policy, are we in fact measuring what matters? Right, so Wilson would say in the moral sense that there are things that we that are difficult to measure that do matter anyway. But when it comes to some of these issues, I was struck by Seth's comments in particular in talking about fragile neighborhoods and what, what we know composes fragile neighborhoods. And then thinking about what both Soledad and the mayor talked about when you look at what I call kind of the Maslow's hierarchy of community. If you don't get the security safety piece right, kind of nothing else matters. But are we thinking about public safety through the lens of community or just as a data point that we are trying to reduce? And I wonder as we think about political will, if we thought more about these community-based metrics and community-based rhetoric around why we're making particular policy decisions, whether the discussion around issues like public safety would be framed in a different way. If we thought about homelessness really as a way, as, as a policy challenge to families and the sustainability of communities and to the mayor's point that he has raised many times, that it is a moral crisis, homelessness is. And do communities, municipalities, states, have the political will to address homelessness as a crisis in which we're asking the question, I care about you too much to let you die on the street. Now that's a very community-based question as opposed to a straight quantitative or technocratic set of questions. And so I hope as we move now into this panel, which is going to be, I know, a combination of both policy discussion but also philosophy and theory, that we think about the rhetorical piece of this as well. Because another word for political will is you are not winning the public conversation. You are not winning the political conversation. You may know what the policy answers are, but you're not winning the political conversation. And so how we understand and communicate these issues, uh, I think, is an important part of this broader communitarian movement.
So without any further ado, let me bring up my good friend, also somebody who was there at the beginning, John Wood Jr. Uh, John is the national ambassador to Braver Angels. He's been a big part of the work of the American Project, now Mies Institute, uh, since we started back in 2017. And he is going to lead this next panel with some uh, great scholars looking at how we think about, describe, and discuss uh, this communitarian movement. So please welcome John. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, Pete. And of course, it is always a pleasure to be here at the Pepperdine School of Public Policy uh, in the presence of very much uh, loved and respected uh, friends, colleagues, and associates uh, here to have conversations about things and ideas that truly matter with people who are in a position to uh, provide some deep insight here. And so I am pleased uh, to be joined by, uh, from uh, starting uh, nearest to me, towards the end of the table, uh, Roberta Herzberg, Distinguished Senior, Senior Fellow for George Mason uh, University. It's a pleasure to meet you for the first time today, uh, Roberta. Uh, likewise, uh, Michael Federici, and I hope I'm getting your name right, Michael. You and I are newly acquainted as well. Professor of Political Science, Middle Tennessee State University. Uh, as well as to his left, uh, Jeff Jeff Pallett. Now, Jeff, I've been calling you Pallett all of this. Uh, that's correct. All of, okay, I was just yeah. wondering if you were trying to conceal a French association. I am, <laughs> but uh, it's also <laughs> correct. <Yeah. laughs> because he's an American. There you go. There you go. I had a sneaking suspicion. So I'm sorry. Sorry to call you out. Um, director of the Ford Leadership Forum of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential uh, Foundation, and so. Uh, we are, as Pete mentioned, here to have a conversation that weaves together in many respects uh, philosophy, policy, and uh, sort of the cross currents of some of the different ways in which uh, we look at uh, conservatism through the lens of communitarian thinking and perhaps vice versa. Um, I want to encourage each of you in your opening, um, in your opening uh, statement here uh, to say a little bit, perhaps, about what brings you into, what, what has stimulated your interest in the particular uh, uh, tradition of thought that you are here to speak a little bit to uh, today. But I have a particular sort of prompt to kick uh, each of you off. So I'm going to start uh, uh, at the far end of the table here. Uh, Jeff, uh, you're here to talk a little bit today um, about the issues we've mentioned through the lens of the work of Robert Nisbet. Robert Nisbet, of course, was the author of a book called *The Quest for Community*. Uh, therefore, you know he is the he is the uh, he's inspired sort of the naming of our of our gathering here. Uh, it's my understanding that Robert Nisbet had sort of two core pillars that by which he defined uh, uh, conservatism. And if I if I understand correctly, Robert Nisbet did not originally identify himself as a conservative until having read *The Conservative Mind* by Russell Kirk, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Uh, but Robert Nisbet, from my understanding, believed that a conservative should be concerned with two things. One, rolling back sort of the overarching reach of the intrusive sort of centralized state. And two, building out a culture of social pluralism through investing in civil society. Is that a sufficient way of understanding what conservatism uh, is, Jeff? And, and, and because many people might say maybe that's missing some things, but perhaps not. Why did that work as a definition of conservatism to Robert Nisbet? Oh, uh, thanks, John. Uh, Thank good you. to see you again. Um, Indeed. Yeah, I don't think uh, uh, Nisbet was particularly concerned about uh, defining conservatism. He's mm -hmm. not a dogmatist. Uh, he was a genuine scholar. Uh, who was um, looking at things as he saw them and didn't like to get particularly uh, absorbed by a movement. Um, the book, The Quest for Community, uh, was written in 1953. And 53 is sort of an interesting year in the history of conservatism. It was the year that Russell Kirk published The Conservative Mind. It was the year that Leo Strauss published Natural Right and History, uh, the year this book was published a year after Eric Vogelin wrote uh, New Science of Politics. But those four books, in some ways, form the kind of intellectual backbone of modern American conservatism. And one thing they all have in common, or I guess two things they all have in common, 
Uh, you know, Pete gave you a bit of an introduction to Nisbet. Uh, in 1943, he got his uh, doctoral degree in uh, 1939. In 1943, he joined the Army and fought in the Pacific Theater for two years. Um, and then came back, uh, wrote a book or two, um, and then kind of uh, wrote what I think is his most important book, The Quest for Community. Um, and all four of these books are in a certain sense shaped by the same phenomenon, and that is the uh, advent of modern totalitarianism. Uh, and for all four thinkers, in some ways, totalitarianism uh, represents not just a difference in kind from modern state-based democratic politics, but in some sense a difference in degree. Um, because the underlying um, thing in, in, all of the, in, all, in all modern politics is the modern state. And so you rightly draw attention to the fact that that's the thing that Nisbet's really concerned about. How did it come to be and what does it do? And his argument is in some sense a pretty straightforward one. Um, the state is this modern mechanism based upon power and a monopoly on, on uh, the uh, use of coercion and violence uh, that gradually insinuates itself into all other social institutions. And so Nisbet says, um, the, the great debate in modern politics is not between the state and the individual. The great debate in modern politics is between the states and groups, or states and associations. And what the state does is it penetrates into these groups and associations, other institutions, and it gradually absorbs its functions, the functions of these institutions. And by absorbing their functions, it erodes their authority, because authority is always related to function. So we talked about the family in the last panel. Uh, what happens? The state begins taking over functions of the family, educative functions, economic functions, security functions, um, uh, what we might call uh, meaning generating functions, status functions. Uh, Nisbet says that uh, modern Americans live in this kind of perpetual state of status anxiety. We don't know who we are because we don't really know where we are. And not only we don't know where we are geographically, but we don't know where we are in the kind of order of things, the hierarchy of things. And it's knowing our place in the kind of hierarchy of things that generates for us a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging, a sense of knowing and being known of the norms by which we have to live. And so when the state takes over these functions from these other institutions, it um, dislocates, it disassociates, it disassociates the individual from these institutions, and it leaves them lonely, alienated, isolated, purposeless, and so forth. And then it kind of regathers them and uh, tries to substitute for the kind of natural sense of meaning and purpose that we have, a new sense of meaning and purpose that it produces on a grand scale. And the height of this, uh, Nisbet says, and this is the second thing off for these books, especially Kirk and, and Nisbet, the height of this is the state's war-making authority. And uh, so in a certain sense, uh, war becomes the primary expression of the state, collective action toward a large-scale kind of moral goal, which substitutes itself for the kind of moral goals that people would normally have in life were they not kind of absorbed into the war-making authority of the state. Um, and uh, one uh, additional thing he says about that is what it does um, is it um, uh, commands their allegiances. So it takes their allegiances away from neighborhoods or from churches or from family. Um, and uh, it, it's like Tocqueville says in, in Democracy in America, no, so long as it, so long as they think of it and only it, <laughs> right? And it wants to be the only thing that they feel secures their their existence. So he says, uh, Americans, some Americans are libertarians, but most Americans are securitarians, right? And they'll accept the authority of the state because the state promises them the security that it has already taken away from them by dissolving its their associative life. Indeed. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, and so to, to continue with our overview here, uh, Michael, I have a bit of an opening frame up uh, for you, but feel free to expand you know, beyond the, 
the, the scope of this initial uh, uh, question here, but you know, uh, many people uh, you know, sort of credit Russell Kirk with uh, really being sort of the, the root of the American conservative movement, dating back to the publication of the conservative, the conservative mind. Uh, I believe that the reason we are, there's so much of the reason why we would consider Kirk so important to study in this context, in the context of this gathering, is because we are engaged, each of us, in this quest for community. And within the work of Russell Kirk, there seems to be a deep enunciation of communitarian values, the importance of civil society, these intermediary structures, and yet, it seems also to me as if there perhaps are many people who would fly the flag of conservatism who may emphasize sort of a strident sort of individualism while perhaps paying precious little attention uh, to the work of community building and to sort of the communitarian kind of uh, themes of, of, of thought that, that I think uh, you might argue uh, Russell Kirk was deeply concerned with. Is that disconnect real? Am I imagining that? And if it's not real, what, what, what accounts for this? Um, what did Russell Kirk have to say that's relevant to our understanding of community? Thank you for the question, John. And first, before I proceed, I want to thank Pete Peterson for his kind invitation to participate in the conference and to Melissa Espinoza for getting me here and being so gracious <laughs> and organizing parts of the conference and especially my travel. Melissa keeps the trains on time. Yes, <laughs> she sure does. And, and the place. Perhaps the best place to start to explain Russell Kirk's contribution to this notion of community and the theme of the conference is to make reference to his book, The Politics of Prudence, mm. in which he outlines 10 conservative beliefs and it's also important to remember that for Kirk, conservatism was not an ideology. It was a habit of mind. Mm -hmm. And the eighth belief that he lists in the politics of prudence is, and I'm quoting, that it's a belief that conservatives uphold voluntary community quite as they oppose involuntary collectivism. Mm -hmm. So what Jeff was just talking about with regard to Nisbet, a tension between this tendency to centralize versus to keep alive private communities and associations is important to Kirk. And I might add to one of the things that Kirk emphasizes is that it's not simply a matter of the state centralizing power, but it also can happen in economic life as mm -hmm. well, even in the private sphere where large corporations suck the life out of small communities. We could just call that the Walmart problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but Kirk was very sensitive to a strain in utilitarianism that can also destroy community. So the threat is not simply from a big government, but it's also from concentrated economic power as well. Um, but I thought that what I might do to help orient the audience to the ideas of Russell Kirk is just sort of in a sketchy way, an impressionistic way, cover some of his most important ideas and how they're associated with other ideas because all great thinkers, and Kirk is one of those, are synthesizers. They are taking ideas from other thinkers and traditions and they are bringing them together to address a particular uh, context. And Please. so for Kirk, I think there are four big points that are important to his understanding of community. And the first one gets to the core philosophically of why community is important. And in his big book, The Roots of American Order, you find a theme that dates all the way back to at least Plato, and that is the connection between the city and the soul. That the conversations we've been having about virtue are important because the city, our politics, our, our political life, our community life, are all connected intimately to the existential lives of the individuals who live in a particular community. And public policy is something that is shaped by the character, especially of its authors, who view the world in a particular way. Uh, second, Community is vital to human thriving. It's vital to human happiness. And if asked to answer the question, well, why is it vital to human thriving and human happiness? 
Kirk would likely point to someone like Aristotle, who begins from the assumption, based on human experience, of course, that human beings are social and political animals. There are rival ideas, of course, out there that you'd find in thinkers like Thomas Hobbes, or even John Locke to some extent, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. But for Aristotle, the most fundamental point about human beings is that they are social and political animals. He has two other memorable lines about this characteristic of human beings, that only gods or beasts can live outside of the polis, mm -hmm. outside of community, and that the polis pre-exists man. It existed before human beings even existed. Community for Aristotle and for Kirk also depends on friendship, something that we do not talk about in politics, uh, but we should if we care about communities, because community for Aristotle and Kirk is not possible without true friendship in particular. Human happiness then depends on thick communities, thick communities, communities with vibrant private groups and associations, families, churches, neighborhoods, civic groups, a lot of what we heard about in the first panel. And for Kirk, community is a Burkean contract between the dead, the living, and the yet to be born. Community is a historically based thing where self-identity is found in a particular tradition, not in abstraction. Third point. Kirk writes that the erosion of community is the towering moral problem of our time. The erosion of community, the towering moral problem of our time. Community is important because it's where individuals find their identity. It's where they find their purpose. It's where they find their duties. It's where they're born, where they live, where they suffer, they love, they die. It's where human life is lived. And like Robert Nisbet, they were well aware that in the modern era, era, especially in the 20th century, community was losing ground to the state, to pernicious ideologies that undermined the very purpose of community in American life. And then finally, rebuilding community uh, is a matter primarily of the culture and not a matter of politics, which is not to say that politics doesn't have anything to do with community. It does. So we should remember that pernicious policies can destroy community because of what Jeff just said about government replacing private groups and associations. But we should also keep in mind, and something that Kirk emphasized, is that order is the first need of the soul and the first need of the city. And government plays a very important role in making sure that that order exists. And we, we heard a few times on the first panel, if you have a crime-ridden community, if you have disorder and chaos, you can't have true community. You can't have the good things that human beings thrive. And I'll leave you with this last point because my introductory comments had to be so brief. <laughs> but a lot of what Kirk is saying is captured in a highly underrated movie from 20 years ago that Tom Hanks starred in called Castaway. And I wish so dearly I could explain to you why that's so instrumental. Perhaps if somebody asked me a question about the <laughs> <laughs> connection between Castaway and Kirk, I could explain it, but I, I'm going to have to leave it right there. <laughs> Cheap way to get extra time, I'm telling you right now. <laughs> there, there's something to be said about fishing for a question about Castaway, <laughs> yeah. actually. Yeah. Uh, so let's circle back with a joke on that front. Mm. Um, OK, fantastic. Well, and, and you mentioned, um, uh, Michael, the uh, the sort of uh, uh, oft unremarked upon uh, value and virtue in both the teachings of Aristotle and Kirk uh, of friendship, right? Um, and um, it reminds me that, not to shamelessly plug uh, my own work, or maybe just a little bit, but Braver Angels, we're, for those who don't know, we're the largest grassroots bipartisan organization in America dedicated to the work of political depolari depolarization. But I oftentimes describe that work as sort of de deepening, sort of a reviving uh, the sort of communal spirit of American democracy. And in that context, a lot of what we emphasize is the importance of civic friendship, uh, if you will, relationship building, 
across political differences in a way that's rooted in, in goodwill. And I wonder if that, um, I wonder if, uh, Roberta, that's not potentially a reasonable segue uh, towards some consideration of the work of Eleanor Ostrom. Um, because it seems that so much of what she brought to our understanding of economics, and in particular how we deal with, quote, the tragedy of the commons, and perhaps you can explain a bit for us what that means, you know, is the importance, the sort of practical utility of proximal relationships between people and between people and the resources that they manage. So perhaps you can remark upon that, but uh, fundamentally I'm wondering, uh, in the case of Eleanor Ostrom, um, we're talking about a thinker who did not necessarily, um, from what I understand, self-identify as a political conservative, and yet we are here talking about her in this conference and her work has clearly influenced uh, conservative thought. What is the connection there? Why are we talking about uh, Eleanor Ostrom? Well, thank you so much, and thank you, Pete and Melissa and everyone for this conference. I love it so far. I was <laughs> champing at the bit to get at questions in the first uh, because they're so related to the work of uh, Ostrom and local governance. I think uh, the reason you would want to know about Lynn Ostrom and Vincent Ostrom, Vincent Ostrom might well consider himself a conservative. Uh, they were a pair and when uh, the Nobel Prize Committee uh, phoned Lynn Ostrom to grant her the first uh, uh, female recipient of the prize in economics in 2009, she turned uh, to Vincent and said, we won the prize. Mm -hmm. Now Vincent was older and, um, and uh, Lynn only had three years after that uh, to contribute uh, to our scholarship. But they very much worked together and so Lynn's work on community, and she was recognized mostly for her work on governing the commons and her work on, on people solving difficult problems when working together. But they approach this as an individual. Uh, how do individuals come together to make communities and work together to solve challenging problems? The tragedy of the commons you may have heard of, I'm sure most of you have, it's if in fact we face a common dilemma, think environmental pollution, all of us will act on our self-interest and we will destroy that common, whether it's the air shed or it's you know a park, it's the pasture land with putting too many cows, and what Ostrom, both of the Ostroms, but especially Lynn in, in this case, empirically noted is when they went out to look, they found people solved problems all the time that should have been tragedies, mm -hmm. that should have been disasters. Now, they weren't nice about it. People fought. That's the one thing I, I love, and I can just see Lynn doing this. It was a, around the Nobel Prize. She goes, People aren't always nice. Yeah. They fight with one another. But in communities, you build enough credibility with your neighbors that when you fight, it doesn't destroy everything between you. And that's what we've really lost, I think. Their work starts that I think is most relevant for this conference, not with the governing the commons natural resource tragedies, although all around the world this is a problem communities and, and neighborhoods and, and uh, common groups face. It started with work on metropolitan governance in the United States and the consolidation of those metropolitan governances bringing all little governments together in the name of equity, in the name of solving real serious issues that had emerged in the United States coming out of the Jim Crow and all of that. So they were trying to say when people consolidate these large communities like Los Angeles, like Indianapolis, in the name of creating greater equity across all of those little communities that had been segregated in the past due to policies, 
what they're forgetting is what they're breaking down in that consolidation. Hmm. It does not become easier for a person of low income or an African American family to go four buses across town to deal with their political leaders. Even though their schools were worse on paper, even though their police force may look worse on paper, according to the experts, they were their police force. They were their schools. And when Joey didn't do well in school, mom could bring him by the ear down the block and say, tell me why Joey isn't. And now, in order to do that, they had to go down to the city center. Out of this, they developed an entire theoretical structure based on polycentricity. So we live in communities, but those communities can be at different levels depending on the nature of the problem, but we never lose our own community in that. If we have big problems like air pollution, let our individual communities work together and try and create that. That was really the Ostroms. And it comes back to this notion, and I'm probably going on too long, of co-production. Anyone who has ever been in a school, I assume that's all of us, we're in one now, so it is all of us, um, knows no one can teach a child who doesn't want to learn. It is co-produced. Most of the things we care most deeply about are things that are co-produced. Safety, the police, and the citizenry. If the police have to be there every time something bad happens, we will all be unsafe, and that's what we're finding today. But if we look out for each other, the neighborhood watch, if we look out we create a lot of safety for ourselves, but we have to be supported in that. And that is the co-production. And so the Ostrom said, if you're going to have co-productive goods, you have to let the people producing those goods on both sides have a say in how they will be produced. Otherwise, they will not commit to them, they will not be legitimate, and they will fall apart over time because they do not meet the real needs of the people on the ground. And so I think that's their greatest contribution and why you really would want to look at the work of the Ostroms on metropolitan governance and on Lynn Ostrom's work on governing the commons and institutions designed to create incentives for people to serve what matters to them, which is the communities that they live in and their neighbors. Thank you very much, Roberta. And Roberta, Michael, Jeff, I do want to encourage you guys, um, if there is something that you hear one of your co-panelists say that you want to offer a response to or for triggers of thought, feel free to, feel free to interject. Um, but Jeff, uh, you know, uh, this, this, this idea of polycentricity is a really, is a really interesting one. And it makes me wonder um, if, when we're thinking about, you know, the work of Robert Nisbet and the general sort of wisdom of the communitarian themes that we're, we are exploring here, um, you know, the, this sort of impulse to ultimately be very wary and cautious with respect to centralized power, but also wanting to sort of maximize the capacity of the social bonds within institutions and community and civil society to effectuate uh, uh, the, the, the optimal solutions to, to the problems we face. Uh, is, there, um, is there sort of a neat and tidy way to sort of uh, summarize uh, sort of, you know, what the lessons are from a policy-making vantage point for the different levels of government that we uh, that we have a relationship to. Is there just sort of is there a fundamental sort of piece of wisdom that we can say, you know, this is a theme that the federal government needs to keep in keep in mind. Uh, but when it comes to state governments or perhaps local governments, more specifically, there's a different set of lessons that can be drawn from the thought of Nisbet or, or, or Kirk uh, or Austin for, for that matter. Um, how do you think about the applicability uh, of the thought of Nisbet and these other thinkers to the different levels of government at which we operate, uh, at which we operate society? Yeah, he's an interesting thinker in this regard. Um, this particular edition of the Quest for Community is a little misleading because it has like a 1950s schoolhouse, and, you know, 
Sure. People drive in their Packards and <laughs> walk around with their fedoras. Sure. And, uh, <laughs> and Nisbet is clear throughout this book. Um, uh, you can't be nostalgic in, mm. in terms of community. Um, those communities have been dismantled. And the problem that we face is that the same thing that But the fedora survives. The for fedora, well, and, and, and some, in some <laughs> for, settings, for the Packard times. doesn't. Um, uh, but the, the same force that dismantled these communities, these associations, uh, is now a force that is preventing new ones from being born. And uh, so what's required is um, a tremendous kind of localized energy uh, and, and, and resistance, uh, and in some sense, a, a kind of civil disobedience on the part of people. Um, because I, I think uh, Roberta's exactly right. I think it's one of the things that um, uh, Nisbet argues is that communities uh, work when they're mutually generated, when they operate on relationships of mutual dependence, uh, when they're formed around relationships of trust, um, and uh, when they're self-generated with regard to a kind of coherent set of goals and objectives. Like we know exactly what we want to do here. We don't need this institution to do everything. Right? We're kind of limited in our goals and our objectives. We just want our schools to do this. Right? We just want the police to do this. Right? Uh, and, and, and so what we have, and this is your original question, is this plurality of institutions and associations that um, operate as kind of make weights against each other, right? And so they're kind of zealously guarding their own prerogatives, right? Um, and they're, they're, they're developed internally. Uh, the, the Andre and I were talking about this last night at dinner, right? The kind of stuff that he's doing, you're going to find out about it later. Right? This is all developed internally, right? Within these communities, you're building this community, and then you start jealously guarding your prerogatives. Right? And, and uh, if somebody starts trying to take over your functionality or some of your authority, you say absolutely not. Right? Um, but this is the problem that, that uh, Nisbet sees, is that the, the authority, of, not the authority, the power of the modern state is such, um, and this is again a quotation from Tocqueville, it prevents much from being born. Mm -hmm. right? And um, so I, I, I think at this kind of local level, um, you just have to be audacious, and you have to be uh, willing to resist um, encroachments by other institutions, but mainly encroachments by the state uh, to kind of regulate and then deal with the consequences when the consequences come your way. But there's only so much the state can do, mm -hmm. right? I mean, its power is not as unlimited as it likes to pretend it is. Right. And, and, and Jeff, before we, before we uh, 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 move on from your uh, comments here, I noticed that you, at a certain point in the answer you just gave, began to use the word uh, power and then switch to authority. And I think that, that there was a reason for that. Could you say something a little, let's say a little something about Nisbet's differentiation between the idea of power as opposed to authority? Well, John, it's interesting that you asked me that question. <laughs> I wrote it, I wrote it down. We, we did not rehearse this. We did not. No, we did not. Uh, so here's the, here's the difference. The state runs on power. So what are the, what's the difference between power and authority? Right. Power is seized or grasped. Authority is natural. Right? The, the authority of a parent over a child is a natural relationship. It's organic. Right? It emerges out of, out, out of things. Power is jealous. Mm. Authority is generous. Right? It's willing to share itself uh, with, with other modes of authority. Uh, power is about control. Authority is about concern. Parents don't seek to control their children. They're concerned for the well-being of their children. Power is abstract, right? It tries to be uniform and the same everywhere. Uh, authority is concrete. It attends to the particular thing. And it's concerned with the particular thing. It doesn't need to aggregate. It doesn't need to be universal. It's fine-grained. It's microscopic. It's not telescopic. Um, and power is, as I said, monolithic. It wants uniformity. Uh, uh, authority is pluralized. Uh, so this is a, the big thing for uh, Nisbet, is um, this pluralized society where you have all these competing authorities, and they're okay with not agreeing with one another. Uh, you know, so um, 
we, we talked about this at dinner last night, right? You're, you're running this program and you have kids who come from this family who have maybe a different religious background or a different set of ideas, right? We don't intrude upon that, mm -hmm. right? Because <laughs> that's not your business in a certain sense. Your business is to do this particular thing, right? It's not expansive in the way that power is. Power is always expansive. Mm, indeed. Thank you, Jeff. Yep. And, um, you know, for me, that, uh, that con contrasting dynamic between power and authority has a great deal of, of relevance when we think about both leadership as well as leadership in the context of building, of building community. Um, you know, we're, of course, you know, pleased to be joined today uh, by Bob Woodson of the Woodson Center and John Ponder of Hope for Prisoners. And I know through being familiar uh, with their work that so much of what these gentlemen focus on is cultivating uh, these sort of qualities and virtues of leadership that allow for sort of the credibility of leadership to be something that is earned rather than something that is simply inherited through title or resource or you know, privilege in some, that's conveyed through, through some other means. And Michael, I, I want to take that observation as an opportunity to invite you to remark upon the sort of Kirkian relationship to virtue uh, and perhaps the particular, particular virtues because I think that one major part of what has been hollowed out in the political and philosophical conversation in American society today, right and left, is yes, an understanding of community, what it takes to build community and strengthen relationships, but also the internal dispositions and, 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 and qualities of character that allow for us as individuals to build authority, perhaps in, 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 in sort of echoing uh, uh, Jeff's treatment of the term here, but the sort of credibility of relationship and leadership from which community and functioning institutions can spring in the first place. What does Russell Kirk have to say about uh, virtue, Michael, and how should that inform our understanding of the project of community building um, in, in our, in our uh, pr larger sort of work of self-government? Well, the, the quick answer is that Kirk believed that virtue was essential to community building, and he drew on the works of T.S. Eliot, who he corresponded with for a number of years. And he would quote part of Eliot's poem, Choruses from the Rock, in which uh, Eliot has a couple lines. They go something like this. They dream of systems so great that no one will need to be good. Mm. The dream of systems so perfect that no one will need to be good. Uh, right. Meaning that, and this is to me very common in contemporary politics, people talk about doing such great things. You know, in international politics, we're going to make the world safer, democracy, we're going to eliminate war, we're going to do all these things. And virtue has nothing to do with it. Somehow, great things are going to be achieved, like the elimination of international conflict. And yet, virtue has no role in this. How many things do you know of in real concrete life? that have been accomplished without virtue, without the work of virtue, without existential work that human beings have to do. And Kirk's point about T.S. Eliot is we're in the sense in which Re Richard Weaver talks about ideas having consequences. Conservatives in Kirk's view were competing with many progressive liberals who had that mentality that all that matters is sort of the dream the dream of the better world, but not the work of virtue. Right. And that so focus and attention needed to be put back on doing the work of virtue. And that meant in the sorry, contemporary language of social justice, that the problem with many social justice movements is that they shift the focus from the individual, from the soul, from that existential work to society. You know, critical race theory, for example, is one of those places that says, Race is not a problem of individual character. You know, someone like Kirk would say, well, it absolutely is, right? It's how one human being treats and views another human being. It's fundamentally a problem of character. Not fundamentally, not that it isn't at all a problem of institutions, but it's not fundamentally a problem of institutions. It's fundamentally a problem of the soul. It's a disorder of the soul. That someone would see another human being as unequal simply because they had different color skin. It's an absurdity at the level of virtue. And Kirk would say, you're not going to make true progress in an area of something like racial inequality unless you address the problem where it exists fundamentally, and that is in the life of the soul, in the life of, the virtue, of virtue. You can't go to the big things first. 
It's not that you don't do the work of institutions, you don't do the work of policy, but they're prerequisites to doing that work. And virtue is the primary prerequisite. You need to order yourself first before you're in a position to go out and order society. You know, it gets back to that first thing I talked about in my opening remarks between the city and the soul. Indeed. Well, thank you very much, Michael. And, uh, and, and just a reminder to folks in the room, uh, we will be moving to Q&A uh, before too long here. And so if you want to write out your questions, I imagine somebody will bring me a stack of cards at some point. We'll be able to get you into the, uh, get you into the conversation. Um, but Roberta, you know, I'm curious to know, so you know, part of what we've spent the last several minutes talking about are both sort of you know, the limitations of centralized power, uh, to be specific, um, you know, federal government, uh, the state, in terms of its ability to sort of effectively respond to community level and local level uh, problems, perhaps because of its level of, of, of distance and unearned uh, power, that is to say non-organic, I guess, uh, to take it back to Jeff's uh, framing. And we've also talked about uh, here, of course, virtue, the internal sort of elements of character that allow for effective community building and engaging, generating of material solutions to material problems. Uh, Eleanor Ostrom, uh, from what I understand, uh, devised or, or derived through her observations of, of communities successfully, uh, successfully addressing what would otherwise have been the tragedy of the commons and fostering real workable solutions. Um, I think, uh, uh, was it eight design principles, mm -hmm. principles of, uh, of design that uh, corresponded to successful community level engagement of, common, uh, of, co of commonly held resources. Are there uh, lessons to be learned in those principles or things that we can highlight that exist as they do in her understanding uh, precisely perhaps because on the one hand, they answer this issue of, of centralized authority being too far removed to be an effective solution maker on the ground, as well as this idea that within individual relationships or community relationships, there are ways of being that virtuously allow us to affect solutions you know, more optimally in the places where we live. Yes, <laughs> she, <laughs> okay. uh, she obviously, and uh, she looked at all sorts of communities around uh, the world and that had would have been characterized as tragedies in most circumstances. And the first rule she found is most were. That's number one. It's not easy to solve these problems. People aren't virtuous necessarily. It'd be great if everyone was, but frequently you will have at least some component of the community that are not virtuous in the way that we might want how do we design institutions that can facilitate as much virtue as possible in the actions that people have towards one another? That was really their puzzle. Great if you got it, because that's the easiest kinds of communities. Religious communities have the underlying theology to call on when, in fact, people are in doubt about what to do, and that takes you a long distance down the way. It's why most of our successes come out of those types of communities or some spiritual type of, of thing. Mm -hmm. But what happens when you have very diverse communities, as we have almost everywhere, um, then it becomes much more difficult. So some of the things that she found were consistent with success, clear boundaries around the community. So we know who is part of us and we know who is not. So if we're a fisherman in a village, we know who can come and fish in our community and we know who shouldn't be there taking our fish. And so that's one of the things that leads to greater success. But again, that's a challenge if in fact we want to be very open. A second thing that was very critical was having monitoring and enforcement mechanisms. And that's another reason why small communities do better than these very large communities, in part because it's easier for us to know what your neighbors are doing and to feel the pressure that you know your neighbors know what you are doing. Mm -hmm. That I live in Utah, 
And anyone familiar with Utah knows we all live in communities in Utah. You, can't, you don't have to be a member of the LDS Church, but you are a member of a ward. No matter what, you're a member of a ward because wards are drawn on the map. And I was the member of the ward that had the little star next to him that said, free for the asking, go get her, you know. <laughs> but, because it's an evangelical church, so they're always, you know, ready to bring another member right. uh, into the fold. So when they come, but I was part of the cookie tree and I was part of the, she just had a baby, you're bringing salad and, and bread on this night because we're gonna handle family obligations. We're gonna tend to the kids. People tended the kids for free in Utah when I was raising my children. These are important community things that happen. And those are the types of institutional arrangements, obviously often linked to these uh, things with virtue and other undergirding culture and language, but not necessarily having that still able to try and find ways that we can build those kinds of institutions. But that means almost always keeping them very local. Mm, indeed. Now, uh, hey, John, John, if I can. Yes. Genuine communities are about belonging. Sham communities are about inclusion. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Inter interesting distinction, provocative. Um, and uh, Roberta, I, I, have a, I have a potentially uh, provocative question for you here too, just as a quick, uh, quick uh -oh. follow up. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, church, you mentioned religious association. Tim Carney, who I don't know, perhaps Tim isn't at our conference this year, um, but the author of Alienated America and an advisor to uh, the American uh, Project. Um, Tim has argued that while there's a very wide range of important uh, civil society institutions, that uh, the truly indispensable civil society institution, or at least the most indispensable one, is the church. Do, do you... Um, do, do you agree with that as a, as a strict statement? Uh, would you qualify it? How important is the church in particular to sort of anchoring you know, uh, com civil society and community and allowing for us to address some of the ground level challenges that you have studied? I, I think empirically it is. Yes. There's just no doubt. But part of it is if you study these things from the perspective of public choice, which the Ostrom did, and you believe that individuals have incentives and interests and will act upon those and you need to recognize those in designing the institutions, then having God is a really handy thing to keep people accountable. Mm -hmm. Because God knows whether you did that or not. God is the afterlife. You can't even get out of it at death in the way that taxes and, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Sure whatever, we're mm -hmm. supposed to be able to. I, I don't think that's quite true, but in any case, that, that agreed to and understood part of your life holds you accountable to your community and to the others who believe that. And so we don't need, it's, it's like kids in Santa Claus in that regard. You can have something, but you have to believe and we don't believe Santa Claus as we move on, but we do believe our theological ties. And as a result, that's what ties us together. And so I think empirically it's true, it's almost impossible to design a completely secular arrangement that has that capacity, that level of enforcement, that level of monitoring, and thus, most of our secular institutions are not going to be as robust or resilient. Right. Yeah, indeed. That <laughs> well, that strikes me as a profoundly important point. So thank you for that, Roberta. And um, before we go to questions, uh, Jeff, Michael, I, I, wanna, I wanna throw a uh, potentially touchy uh, final uh, uh, prompt at, at the two of you. And uh, th this, this doesn't come from a place of wanting to sort of spark a sort of you know sectarian kind of you know um, conflict within the conservative movement. At, at the same time, uh, both Kirk and Nisbet um, were critics of sort of the 
the, the cultural and philosophical direction that mainstream conservatism took and ultimately, you know, these debates continue and intensify to, to this day. Um, rather than pick out particular sorts of strains, whether they're talking about populism or libertarianism or nationalism or what have you, and, and ask you to sort of critique these things through a Kirkian or, 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 or a Nisbet, uh, Nisbetian, so to speak, sort of prism, I guess I would simply ask the two of you this. Um, what, does, what does a conservatism look like absent a conception of virtue? What does conservatism look like absent a deep commitment to community? Right? And um, I guess if I can throw this on top of it, and I, I'm not sure where uh, Nisbet was on this question, but I have a fair sense of Kirk on this point. Um, what does conservatism look like, not necessarily with a direct sort of fealty to any particular religious denomination, but absent a larger anchoring in the idea that we live in a universe that is, that is designed according to a greater order, according to a greater, a force greater than ourselves. What does conservative look like, conservatism look like if it, if it doesn't have those things? Starting with you, Jeff. Uh, unattractive is what it looks like. <laughs> um, uh, you know, conservatism is uh, not an ideology, it's not a dogma, it's a disposition that people have. And um, it's a disposition based uh, ultimately on affection. And it all turns on affection. And um, you know, I, I think you know we, we've talked a lot about neighborhoods and, and local places. And um, th there's a really cool essay by um, uh, Nisbet called "What to Do When You Live in an Iron Age." And uh, this is the, the age that we live in. It's from uh, Ovid's Metamorphoses. You know, in the Golden Age, people stayed on their native shore, right? but in the Iron Age. They cast their sails to the winds, hmm. right? And they go wherever the wind blows them. There's nothing anchoring them. Um, and so uh, what anchors us are these kinds of affections and allegiances that human beings would normally and naturally have. Were they not altered somehow by some kind of intrusive external force? Um, and, uh, you know, in some ways, um, uh, for uh, Nisbet, the, the, the external forces are the combined force of state-based politics and modern industrial capitalism, um, all of which um, uh, act as a kind of solvent. You know, and democratic egalitarianism is kind of the ideological justification for these things. But this all acts as a kind of solvent upon um, piety, devotion, loyalty, obligation, duty, commitment, st stability, uh, right? It acts as a solvent. And so what we end up with, as, as Nisbet says, are individuals who hang loose upon the world. Yeah. Right? They hang loose upon the world. Uh, and they'll relocate themselves geographically all the time. They'll relocate themselves in their relationships. They'll take personal happiness to be the greatest goal for human beings. Uh, and, and so all these old virtues, you know, these kind of classical Roman virtues, right, sort of get eroded. Um, right, there, there's this corrosion. He, he says uh, um, one of the great problems in a later, one of the last books he wrote called The Present Age, like one of the great problems in the modern era is that our relationships are all shaped by the cash nexus. Mm -hmm. right, this is how the, and, and what cash is uh, ultimately is liquidation. Right? And so everything in the world becomes fluid. Right? Wealth becomes fluid. Uh, careers become fluid. Identity becomes fluid. Right? Everything becomes fluid, and there, there's uh, nothing stabilizing. So what we have to do are recapture these sort of old virtues of 
you know, like when I was on campus and people would talk about critical thinking all the time because it's apparently way different than normal thinking. <laughs> um, uh, you know, so how about instead of critical thinking, we talk about maybe piety, pious thinking, you know, that commits to something, that's dedicated to something, that's affectionate for something, that recognizes the value of things, that attaches rather than detaches. Um, and I, I think for uh, Nisbet, this, this uh, gift for attachment, this desire for attachment in an age of detachment is kind of a central idea. Hmm. Indeed. Thank you, Jeff. And Michael? Just very quickly. So what does conservatism look like without virtue? One, it looks for substitutes of attachment. So one is to the war state hmm. and America as an ideology where the world becomes America's business mm -hmm. and we build the military industrial complex. Um, two, human happiness is somehow satisfied by mere economic materialism. Um, that the measure of good policy and politics is GNP, inflation, unemployment, which are all important things, but it overemphasizes those things. And the third thing would be the promotion of individual freedom for its own sake, not for anything higher, not for what Kirk calls the permanent things. But it would be an emphasis on those three things that which, in Kirk's mind, would have lost their way from what matters most to human beings, mm. like friendship. Mm. Indeed. Wise and concise. Thank you, Michael. And thank you to our panel. This is, that is fantastic and much appreciated. And now uh, we'll take a few minutes and go, go to your questions. Uh, starting with, uh, with a particularly good question, I think, from Scott Winship. And this is, this is a very original one. I like this. Uh, Scott asks, he says, um, how does Castaway illustrate Kirk's ideas? <laughs> and how does Wilson figure in? Uh, <laughs> Michael, I feel like that's a good one for you. <laughs> I'm surprised I'd by... I'd like to take that. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> surprised by the question and yeah. unprepared, but I'll, <laughs> I'll do what I can. <laughs> Community has to do largely with human attachment. Right. And in the movie Castaway, we really meet two parts of the main character, Chuck Nolan. His life before his life on the island, and really a third one is his life after the island. And what we learn in the course of the story is that he's lacking in human attachment. His human attachments to his girlfriend, eventually fiance Kelly, is secondary to his attachment to his company, FedEx. And he doesn't have much attachment to friends. He has a friend named Stan who has a wife who has cancer and she's seeking treatment. And he, he has a sense that he's not a good friend. He has a sense, but he doesn't really know what to do about it until he gets on the island, just by chance, plane crashing. And he learns what he's missing once he's alienated from community. And he does a very Kirkian thing, a Voglinian thing, since Jeff has brought up Eric Voglin, and that is he tries to remember when he's alienated from community what it is and why it was so important to him. He's sort of learning what it is. So he draws pictures, art, on the cave wall. He keeps a watch that Kelly gave him on Christmas Eve to remember who she is. He has a package that floats ashore that he never opens up that has angel wings on it. And Wilson is maybe the import, most important piece of them all because Wilson teaches him how to be a true friend. Wilson is so vital to his transformation. Wilson allows him to have conversations. You know, He's thinking to himself, but he articulates it to this volleyball who mm -hmm. is his only friend on the island in one right. sense. And, um, he is learning through the practice and experience what it means to be a true friend and why community is important so that when he returns to civil society, he is transformed. He's a new man because he's now undistracted by these larger distant things and he's worked on the life of the soul. He's become a different human being. And so he's a, he is a better friend. He's a, he's a true friend. 
And that transformation, I think, is what the, the movie is really all about. And the last thing I will say is, you know, Wilson, if you've seen the movie, in the scene where Wilson floats away, it's a very moving scene, and Chuck Nolan cries, and he, he shouts out to Wilson, he apologizes to him, to a, to a volleyball. But it's more than a volleyball, right? It's a symbol for him of what friendship is. And earlier in the movie, when he gets mad at Wilson and he throws him away, he, he vows, he said, never again. Never will I abandon you because you are my friend. And then when Wilson falls off of the raft, he has abandoned him. Mm. But in the last scene of the movie, when he's driving to deliver the unopened package, there's another Wilson volleyball sitting there in the front seat. And for the longest time, I wondered, why has he got that Wilson volleyball there? Mm. But I think the importance of having the volleyball there is just as he had these symbols when he was on the island to help him remember, to recall to memory what is important about human happiness and human existence, to recall to memory the substance of community. That volleyball is there to remind him once he's returned to civil society what his experiences were on that island that were so formative to his transformation in becoming a true friend. And they, they, they bring it back to mind. They recall it in the way that a prophet recalls to individuals what's important, recalls things that have been forgotten. Indeed. Thank you, Michael. We probably should have alerted people to spoilers for anybody who hasn't seen, <laughs> <laughs> hasn't seen the movie. But nevertheless, we all, those of us who haven't, have something to add to our Netflix list here. Um, <laughs> but no, that was profound and relevant. Thank you. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, question from Hans Ziger, and this um, this uh, this is for any and everybody on the panel here. Uh, what is the significance of federalism in the thinking of Ostrom, Nisbet, and and Kirk? I don't know if we uh, want to go down the line on that one, but does anybody want to jump up and, and field that one? Yes, Roberta. Absolutely critical for the Ostroms. Um, Vincent's work started in federalism and understanding the and he found the American founding in Tocqueville to be the the core documents for understanding his political theory, and Lynn builds on that. The key is that's institutional design of federalism that, again, it has all of these individual components that we've been talking about in terms of, of virtue, but how do you do that in a large, diverse society? We can't throw people onto the island for long periods of time till they discover this on their own, so how do we build institutions that allow us to choose our communities, allow us to move around, and allow us to deal with what's most important to us, closest to us, so that we have choice. If the only choice is you must leave the United States, as so many people promise every time there's an election they don't like, I'm going to Canada. Well, fine, sure. go to Canada, you know, it's all good. <laughs> But that's a tough choice, and they never seem to actually go, in my experience. <laughs> they never really move. They then say, no, I'm not going because I'm not going to leave. I'm going to fight another day. But we saw during the pandemic, people moved with their feet. That's the Ostrom's argument. If you can move with your feet, you can change a lot of what is important to you without having to change everything about your governing. The more we move to the upper levels of central government, the fewer our choices are in trying to craft for a diverse society. That works if you're all the same. It doesn't work if you're not all the same. So we need, we need uh, federalism to deal with the diversity of what we really value and what we care about so that we can craft those in our local communities and still live together those diverse communities uh, with one another. Thank you very much, Roberta. And so from, um, uh, oh, uh, Michael, did you have something you wanted to say? Just very quickly. Yeah. Federalism is an institutional manifestation of something that has already been constituted in culture. Hmm. So the framers did not go to Philadelphia in the summer of 1787 and invent federalism like philosophers in a closet. Mm -hmm. America was already a highly decentralized society and they codified it into institutions by creating federal structures. Right. Nisbet, in the present age, talks about how that decentralized culture and society was largely in existence in America until the First World War. And the First World War did a lot to change that, that culture mm. by centralizing power.
Mm, indeed. Well, from, from federalism to personal responsibility, we have a question uh, here from Manuel Gomez. Uh, what role does personal responsibility play in living a life of virtue when everywhere I look, responsibility is being abdicated? And, and I, I might add a little uh, thin layer on top of that but myself by noting that you know we closely associate uh, individualism with personal responsibility. And you know, many people will seem at least to pursue, perceive a tension between sort of you know individual um, individualism versus uh, communitarianism, the emphasis on personal agency versus communal responsibility. But is there a contradiction between these things, or is there a constructive sort of sort of tension? And so, um, uh, Jeff, do you want to take a take a swing at that? Well, there's no responsibility without accountability. Mm -hmm. right, then it's an empty kind of concept. Um, and, and so what uh, it, it seems to me one of the reasons why people are not responsible, if it's in fact the case that people are less responsible than they once were, um, it's because the sort of um, mechanisms of accountability aren't operative. Um, I mean, the, the you know, weakness, uh, the weakness, the weak, one of the weaknesses of his relationship with Wilson um, is that Wilson couldn't hold him accountable mm. to anything. So, um, you know, community only works when you have reciprocal relationships. Uh, otherwise, it's a uh, relationship of, of, of domination, right? I mean, whatever else is true of friendship, it requires a certain amount of reciprocity between the parties. And part of what that reciprocity does is it creates accountability between people. Um, and that accountability in any uh, system of authority where you have uh, norms and guidelines for conduct um, and it's hierarchically arranged, uh, I mean, those hierarchies are natural and they're fine. I mean, we should have them. Um, we have to have them. Um, but they also allow for accountability. Right? Uh, you know, I mean, children do have mechanisms at their disposal to you know, say to their parents, you're not doing your job as a parent. Now, they don't have coercive power or anything like that, but there is a kind of accountability in place there. Um, and so what happens, again, when you start dissociating individuals from one another, what you do is you um, efface these mechanisms of accountability. And what takes their place is right, this sense of personal well-being or personal happiness. As long as as long as I feel good about myself, that's all that matters. But of course, the irony of all this is people end up feeling much, much worse about themselves as a result. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the more they're embedded in systems of accountability and mutual dependence, the better, psychically, just psychologically, the better off they are. Uh, and, and this is the lie that we're being told, that if we emancipate ourselves, this is this is the, 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 the kind of modern language, right? As long as we emancipate ourselves from all these things, that's the key to our personal fulfillment and personal happiness. Mm. And it's the lie that we've been told over and over again, and we're seeing the results of it now. Mm. Indeed. Thank you, Jeff. And I think that this may be our last question here. And it's an interesting question. There's no name on the card here. Uh, but the question is, um, what is the ultimate source of moral authority and how do we reconcile that with pluralism? Um, Michael, I'm going to, um, I'm sorry, actually, well, Jeff, I, I suppose um, I'm thinking of Nisbet here, although um, you're all free to weigh in on this. Um, I do recall Nisbet having a bit of a critique of evangelical conservatism insofar as he felt that enthusiasms were somewhat anathema to the idea of conservatism. I, uh, you know, and if we think of conservatism as a cast of mind, I guess the point there is that you know, if you've got a social movement, and I, I, don't think, I don't imagine this would be restricted to evangelical conservatism, but the idea is that if you're sort of adamantly pursuing sort of an ultimate kind of truth that you want all of society to adopt, that that perhaps finds tension with the social pluralism in which Nisbet uh, believed and felt that conservatives ought to be sort of chiefly sort of concerned with, with preserving. Um, you guys can, can answer the metaphysical question however you might like in terms of the source of ultimate uh, moral authority, but um, I think the question that rides underneath that is, is there a tension between the idea of, you know, of, of truth, capital T, right, 
uh, versus the idea that we need to have space in society for many differing views. How is that reconciled? Let me tee it up for Jeff, Go ahead. if you don't mind. Please. Uh, both Nisbet and Kirk have a very non-sectarian approach to the question about the origin of moral authority. Mm. So it's ecumenical. It can come from a variety of different sources. And as you might expect, because they want things to be decentralized and they want private groups and associations to have authority and autonomy, that means you're going to get variety and pluralism in where people identify the source of that authority. And uh, classical schools, for example, would be something that Kirk would greatly support. It, it can come in a very philosophical way, not a sectarian religious sort of sense. Um, so it's consistent that they're talking about decentralized power, vibrant local communities, and what emanates from that, what really grows from that, is something that's pluralistic. Now, at the same time, they might have said at times, that we need, like Walter Lippmann argued, for something like a public philosophy, not a civil religion, but a public philosophy that at least allows us to hold in common that there is a moral authority. Our understanding of what it is may be different, but it all sort of breaks apart if we don't believe that there isn't a higher authority. Indeed. Jeff and, and Roberta, for that matter, uh, do you guys want to close us out with any thoughts on, thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, uh, philosophers have been trying to settle that question for millennia now. Um, and uh, I figured you'd have the answer, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> if only. I would have I monetized it by now. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I, 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 you can't know. Right? Uh, and this is why these things become matters of faith. Um, uh, but you can't know. I mean, what's... Uh, whatever that source is, we are blinded by its brilliance. Uh, right? We see through a glass darkly. And uh, so what it, recall, what it calls for is a certain amount of intellectual humility um, and uh, a certain amount of generosity um, and, and openness to people that you're talking with. That's pluralism uh, in a certain sense, right? You can say, um, uh, um, I don't know exactly what it is. This is what I believe uh, to be the case. Um, and uh, you know, for that reason, I'm, I'm willing to extend a certain amount of generosity to others. And uh, who knows what I'm going to learn from them? You know, what Mill says, he who knows only his own position knows little of that. Uh, so um, you know, the, 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 quest the, the, the question in part is what's the relationship between some conception of ultimate authority that we have and our conception of social authority? Not so much our conception of pluralism, but our conception of social authority. And that is, do, does our notion of social authority have to be grounded in a clearly identifiable particular notion of what ultimate moral authority is? Um, and, and I think that uh, the answer to that is actually no. And we have less and than for, 60 seconds. But okay, yeah, and for the right. Ostroms, I would argue, um, and Vincent has written on this, um, and, and Lynn has weighed in as well, um, some form of the golden rule is what they believe is sort of a universal notion of how one lives together um, in a moral way. And so they find that in virtually all of the institutional arrangements that work, they operate with that, whether it's whatever form you have of religion. Indeed. And with that, we'll bring our panel to a close. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Roberta Herzberg, Jeff Collette, Michael Federici. And I hope that folks can stick around for Professor Josh Mitchell, uh, Professor Josh Mitchell uh, who's going to talk to us about Alexis de Tocqueville and modern American democracy. It'll be worth hearing. So stick around. Thank you all.